Okay, I wanted to look at the prokaryotes and eukaryotes and the cell organelles all as sort of one big multi-part lesson. So, first of all, one of the most prevalent analogies of the cell is the cell as a city. So there is a central location where the important documents are kept, power plants that keep the city running, factories that make things for citizens, and roads and delivery services that keep everything moving around to where it belongs. While it's a simplistic analogy, it's a great way to think about the cell as a whole rather than many isolated parts. If the cell is the most basic unit of life, then it stands to reason that the parts of the cell must work together to do all the things necessary to sustain life. These parts cannot exist on their own, and so they have to be working together and relying on each other. Let's first talk about the two major types of cells. There is one that is considered simpler, that's the prokaryotes. I hate to call them simple though, they are incredibly diverse and they still manage to kill large numbers of humans each year and that is the bacteria. Prokaryotes are bacteria. They have a plasma or cell membrane that separates them from their environment and a ring of DNA, often called a nucleoid region, that floats free in their cytoplasm. Their cytoplasm is watery cytosol, and which is basically just liquid, mostly water, with dissolved ions in it, and ribosomes, which are three-dimensional complexes made of RNA, and we'll talk more about them in just a second. But what they do not have is any kind of membrane-coated or membrane-enclosed or membrane-bound organelles. Most prokaryotes have cell walls, and many have interior folds in their membranes to allow for photosynthesis. They have extra membrane space there where other proteins can be to do different jobs. Prokaryotes are single-celled, so they need a way to get around. Flagella are long corkscrew-like tails that help to propel them through their environment, and hair-like pili also allow them to stick to each other and other surfaces. Some prokaryotes even have a crude cytoskeleton that provides a frame just underneath the plasma membrane to help support their shape. This is especially important to the rod-shaped bacteria. Eukaryotes are a bit more complicated, but they have the same basic purposes. They're going to store the genetic material, produce and distribute proteins, uh, convert energy through metabolism, communicate with other cells, and move or stay anchored in place, which just depends on the needs of that cell. So to quickly compare them to prokaryotes, they also have a plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and ribosomes but they're going to be 10 times larger. Each cell is about 10 times larger. And then you have to also figure in that eukaryotes are multicellular. So this is going to include your animal, plant, fungi, and pro protist or protista kingdoms. They keep all that extra space organized using compartments that we tend to now call organelles, although that's a tricky term because often now we use organelle to describe all the different little structures that have functions, but it used to just apply to the things that were membrane bound or membrane enclosed, and so that's how they compartmentalize their space. Organelles, like I said, membrane bound or not, play distinct roles in the cell and different organelles have different structures and chemical compositions that allow them to carry out various chemical reactions. So depending on the set of chemical reactions they contain or facilitate, that's going to determine their job. And the most iconic part of any eukaryotic cell is its nucleus. It's actually how eukaryotes got their name. Eukaryote, U for true, and karya or carrion for kernel or nut, which is from the Greek root there. So now that we're done with our comparison, I want to really quickly show you the 
picture of a prokaryote here, so you can see the nucleoid region, the different ribosomes, the cytoplasm, the plasma membrane cell wall and capsule. The capsule is normally a carbohydrate protein complex. The plasmids, which are tiny rings of DNA, which we'll talk more about later, and the pili, which are extensions of the plasma membrane. If you look very closely at the picture, you can see that that plasma membrane is extending out through the capsule, creating the pili there. Here's our eukaryotic cell, and so you can see all the various membrane-enclosed organelles. And then you can see all the components of the cytoskeleton. So those things in blue there are made of cytoskeletal elements. Then you've got your all-important plasma membrane and the various components of the nucleus. And let's focus in on that nucleus, shall we? So the nucleus has a dense inner region called the nucleolus. It is where ribosomes are produced. The rest of the nucleus contains DNA that is normally loosely organized as chromatin, which is just a fancy name for DNA wrapped around proteins. It's called chromatin, chroma for color, because when they first started staining the cells, they could see this protein DNA complex. It was a different color. The nucleus is where this genetic information, the DNA, is stored and where the genetic information is used to control the cellular activities. It's also where the replication of the DNA takes place. The DNA stays safe and secure in the nucleus, safe from all the enzymes and other chemical reactions that are happening outside of that space. And such special activities need a special barrier, and the nucleus has one. The nuclear envelope consists of two membranes. Yes, it gets two membranes. Very important. And it also has these special features called nuclear pores. They're amazing protein complexes. They only let small things in. So only very small, often ions, can get through the pores unaided. Other large substances are going to need a special chemical entry sequence, much like a ticket into the movies. All right, so I'm about to show you a much more advanced, much more recent illustration of the nuclear pore. So don't get overwhelmed. I just You do not have to know this, you know, in all its detail. But it's very cool. So here it is. And you can see, whoop, back up. You can see the nuclear pore here. So it is shaped so, somewhat like a basket. You can also see that there are special little chemical signals that will be needed to exit the basket shape there. So if the RNA needs to get out of the nucleus, it has to leave via a special set of proteins. You can see that there is a double membrane in place there and that the membrane just folds in. It's one continuous double membrane and it's broken up by these nuclear pores and by what we also call MTOCs or microtubule organizing centers which we will discuss much more when we talk about cell division but it's in place ready to help sort the DNA when it comes time to divide the cell. Everything inside the nuclear envelope floats in the nucleoplasm, which is just a fancy name for the liquid contents inside the nucleus, and a special mesh of protein fibers called the nuclear lamina holds the chromatin to the nuclear envelope. And so this is a way of organizing the DNA because when it is not densely packed into a chromosome, that is a very, very loose, stringy chemical, the DNA, that really needs to be somewhat organized in order for it to be used by the rest of the cell and direct the cell activities. The ribosomes that are produced by the nucleolus 
which again is inside the nucleus, travel out of the nucleus through those nuclear pores and into the cytoplasm. And the ribosomes are made of two large subunit or a large subunit and a small subunit. So two subunits of RNA and it's a special kind of RNA called ribosomal RNA or rRNA for short. You can also see here the mRNA and the tRNAs, and all of this helps to link amino acids together to form the growing polypeptide or protein, which you can see there outlined in yellow. So what these tiny machines are doing is they're reading a gene that's been transcribed into mRNA, and they're linking amino acids together to form a protein. Ribosomes can be found free-floating in the cytoplasm or docked on the ER. And the, the ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, just happens to be our next stop on our tour of the cell, which I will pick up in the next screencast.